Welcome, everybody. We're lucky today to have Adam Zimmerman uh, from Loyola uh, Law School in Los Angeles. And Adam graduated uh, magna cum laude from Georgetown University Law, uh, where he was associate editor of the Georgetown Law Journal and co-founded the first student chapter of the American Constitutional Society in the country. He clerked and worked in a number of firms, did a lot of things after graduating. And then he taught in St. John University uh, School of Law, and now he's teaching in Loyola. He teaches and writes on uh, tort law, administrative law, master wow. of complex litigation, and I'm giving short uh, thrift to his many publications and work because I really want to leave as much time as possible for the paper. And this is a paper that's in the intersection between administrative law, uh, complex litigation, and civil procedure, and I think that'll it'll speak to many of you in different ways. Adam. Thanks, Doreen. It's, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really um, glad to have the chance to present this. Um, let me give you, a, a, well, let me present the thesis super briefly, tell you a little background about the paper, and then I'll walk through some of the arguments in it. Uh, so in this paper, I'm gonna make three arguments. And you could say each argument is more outrageous than the next. So the first argument I'm going to make is that appellate courts should hear class actions when they review what the government does. That's something that should upset many people um, in both administrative law and civil procedure because we typically think of appellate courts as courts of first view, of, of courts of review, not first view, um, where they usually don't develop facts in order to um, deal with the many kind of complicated issues that come up in a class action. The second argument is they may already be able to. Um, and I'll be talking about how the All Writs Act may already provide an avenue for appellate courts to do this, and that some appellate courts are already using the, appellate, uh, the All Writs Act to hear class actions. And then the third thing, most outrageous thing I'm gonna say, is that this actually might be consistent with um, the way appellates, the courts work in our uh, judicial system, uh, consistent with our separation of powers and where appellate courts fit in with it, as well as um, a procedural rulemaking. So um, let me tell you before I get into the argument a little bit how I got into this. So uh, if there's a theme that underlies a lot of my work, it's looking at class actions and different forms of aggregation in unusual places. So I've looked at how criminal prosecutors and federal agencies and even the president will sometimes recover large sources of funds from a wrongdoer and then distribute those funds in, in many of the same ways that replicate and look like a class action, raising all the same types of conflicts and presenting some of the same benefits. Um, um, I have a long body of scholarship where I and a good friend of mine have been arguing that administrative agencies should be able to hear class action. Administrative agencies here, depending on how you count, uh, about 10 times as many cases as our federal court system, but without avenues to kind of aggregate those claims, we've argued that they lack the ability to achieve some of the same types of fairness and consistency and efficiencies that class actions do in our federal and state courts. And we made that argument and it got some play, um, and then the federal government actually called us and asked us to do a study on the few agencies that actually heard class actions, and there are some. And so we did that study and we, published a piece about it called Inside the Agency Class Action. And the federal government actually adopted the recommendations that we made. Um, and now um, there are official government regulations that, that say that federal agencies um, are, you know, when, when possible, should consider using class actions in adjudication. Um, that idea uh, was adopted um, in 2017. And since that time, it's had some success. Like some federal agencies, like the Department of Education, began hearing class actions of the Obama administration to deal with student debt relief claims. Um, the Federal Maritime Commission uh, toyed and is still toying with the idea of hearing class actions involving like a $1 billion claim uh, involving antitrust and shipping act claims against foreign shippers. But the place where it was most successful was a federal appellate court. And not just any federal appellate court, but a federal appellate court that hears more uh, claims against government agency, the Department of, Veteran, Department of Veterans Affairs, than any other, than all of the federal appellate courts combined. Um, and it got me thinking, like, 
why just this one appellate court uh, when other federal appellate courts similarly directly review what the government does um, and there is no other court, the district court, that's capable of hearing systematic problems that arise in that agency. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of some things that have happened in other appellate courts where federal appellate judges have said under various channeling statutes and with the appellate court reviews what the government does, they're concerned that their inability to hear the claims might actually um, upset their ability to do their job. So um, years ago, there was a lot of litigation against the Railroad Retirement Board. That's a board that um, oversees the distribution of several billion dollars in funds to railroad workers. Um, it had reduced Nancy Johnson's benefits from about $400 a month to $81 a month because her youngest daughter turned 16. Federal appellate courts in that circuit had repeatedly said that they couldn't be reduced until someone turned 18. Um, the Judge Mikva, when reviewing the case, said, uh, look, you know, this poses a lot of problems if someone is only kind of proceeding directly to a court of appeals that's reviewing what the agency does. If a railroad spouse has the financial and physical strength, lives long enough to make it through the entire administrative process, and then turns to the courts, but if exhaustion overtakes him, we, we run into a process that, that uh, by definition, will leave people um, worse off. They won't be able to access uh, the courts and to deal with a systematic type of challenge um, that is constantly frustrating the appellate court precedent. Um, in the veterans courts, I need to move this out of my screen. In the veterans courts, they've long, uh, there've long been system-wide challenges to the Department of Veterans Affairs because among other things, they fail to provide notice to attorneys, they applaud, apply faulty rating methodologies, they delay benefits. But for over 30 years, um, for over 30 years, the, the federal appellate court charged with reviewing those claims that it lacked the power to hear class actions. And those judges who sat on the federal appellate court worried about what that meant. Many veterans challenged widespread problems in the system. The secretary, according to several judges, would simply, in many cases, just respond to a petition by correcting the problem within a short time, ignoring all of the uh, systemic problems, and then just the, the federal, federal appellate court would have to dismiss the cases as moot. And as a result, you know, only one petition out of a thousand had been granted over the past three years until it adopted and eventually did adopt a class action rule. Um, one last example, let's see if I can get it to click, um, is out of the Ninth Circuit when over 60,000 unaccompanied children crossed the U.S.-Mexico border back in 2014. The nation's immigration courtrooms swelled with young defendants lacking lawyers. Um, uh, but when a lawsuit sought to require that they receive counsel, uh, the court criticized that widespread policy. It said like, look, you know, the net result is that thousands of children, because they can't certify a class action, are allowed to thread their way on their own through the labyrinthine maze of immigration laws, with, which out hyperbole have been termed second only in complexity to the Internal Revenue Code. Um, in each of these cases, the circuit court believed that the agency's systemic practice wasn't just unlawful, but because of delays, because of access to representation problems, um, uh, and because of uh, the in, the because of because of the agency's own process, uh, were unable to obtain federal judicial review at all. But the courts all rejected their motions to find a class action, and why? Because in each case there was a law, there was a statute that channeled all those appeals from the agency into a federal appellate court, which unlike district courts, just don't have formal rules to hear class actions. There are over 200 channeling statutes that work like this, um, that, that instead of assigning uh, cases to district courts, assign them directly to appellate courts to review how government agencies operate. And there's a rationale for this. When Congress does this, it hopes to expedite claims into a federal court that promise more systemic consistency and legal authority to decide what the law is. Um, but without a class action, appellate courts may never review or redress 
many of those systemic government practices. Um, there might be cases where the claims are transitory, they're mooted, they're persistently backlogged, cases where there's just no lawyers who exist to make claims based on precedent established by that appellate court, and cases where courts just lack information about the scope of the problem to craft relief or to make sure relief that they craft is actually effectuated in the end. Um, it used to be the case that, that the Supreme Court would read exceptions to allow district courts to hear these cases to those channeling statutes um, that would ordinarily require direct appellate review. But citing like the importance of channeling statutes, the importance of actually having federal appellate courts expertly and authoritatively resolve what happens in an agency, um, courts have just started reading channeling statutes much more narrowly and much more strictly. Um, and as a result, it's ironically constrained the judicial power of these appellate courts to say what the law is, at least in those cases involving mass adjudication systems by agencies, veterans, immigration, black lung, where those courts are hearing questions that involve systemic misconduct or systemic delays in that government agency. So the proposal in this paper is that appellate courts should be able to hear class actions themselves. When a channeling statute says that it's not a district court, but an appellate court that's supposed to directly review what an agency does, an appellate court should have the same tools that that district court has to hear those kinds of claims. Now, appellate courts don't have fact-finding authority, so if necessary, an appellate court could remand those types of, if it needs fact-finding, remand the case to an agency to develop the facts, which a federal appellate courts have done um, by kind of inventing that rule out of their own without a rule to do so since the 1940s or they might be able to appoint special masters in certain cases, or in certain types of channeling statutes, there might even be an outlet to use a district court. Um, under the All Writs Act, appellate courts arguably can already do this. That's an act that was, uh, has existed since 1789, but was made applicable in 1940 to the federal appellate courts, and it confers on courts a legislatively approved source of procedural instruments not confined to the precise forms of what the writ was in common law, and relying on the All Writs Act, this is a totally new. Appellate courts have done this in the context of federal habeas cases, uh, allowing representative actions modeled after Rule 23 when there was no rule to do so under the All Writs Act. And my, my argument is that if we allow claimants to at least proceed in those extreme cases that merit review under the All Writs Act. The All Writs Act is not an easy statute to, to actually bring a case. And at a minimum, it will allow federal appellate courts that are charged with directly reviewing an agency to say what the law is for parties, courts, and for Congress. Um, now, with the remaining time that I have, I just wanted to spend a little time talking about what these channeling statutes are. Um, I wanted to talk about what the, some of the specific challenges were for, for individuals, um, a little bit of deta more detail about what the AWA is, what the All Writs Act is, um, and give you some of the examples in action. Because like I said, there's a federal appellate court now that is now hearing class actions itself when it reviews what the uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs does, and the, the power it's invoking is the exact same power that federal appellate court, other federal appellate courts have. The All Writs Act applies to all federal appellate courts. Um, so, channeling statutes. Congress has been writing laws that channel review of government bodies um, uh, since 1913, um, and it frequently will write laws saying that a district court or a federal appellate court could do so, I, I began reviewing them. There's over 600 laws that do it and more than 200 channel review of what a government agency does into a federal appellate court. Uh, so uh, since the 19, since in 1975, the Administrative Conference, which is a federal agency that reviews what all their agencies do, um, recommended that um, appellate courts directly review what many agencies do. Um, and try to bring some some uh, sense to the chaos because it used to be that there was just like a strew of just random assignments to federal and district courts, sometimes involving the same agency and sometimes in 
involving the same type of case. And what David Curry and, and, and Goodman um, came to the conclusion was that th it does make sense for federal appellate courts to review what agencies do. And in many cases, federal agencies are developing a record, much like a trial court. So you don't necessarily need a trial court to kind of understand what happened below. And the thought was that at least in some cases, direct appellate review would offer faster and a more coherent form of judicial oversight. You have a big federal body operating across the country, and it made sense. Let's have a federal appellate court, which oversees the law for a large region of the country, to kind of define what the law is for those federal appellate bodies. Uh, the only times where they, they recommended that there be a district court were those cases where there were just tons of cases where there was a need to kind of uh, screen out cases um, uh, to reduce appellate caseloads, or when there was an acute need in the majority of cases for fact-finding. But short of that, it made sense to channel cases into federal appellate courts. Um, unfortunately, Congress still doesn't always follow that philosophy. It still tends to kind of randomly assign um, things and sometimes does so unthinkingly. Um, a very recent study said there were very few patterns that emerged from the seemingly random distribution of ways in which we review what agencies do. Um, but this is a particular problem uh, that no one has addressed for agencies that engage in mass adjudication, veterans claims, immigration claims, black lung claims, longshore workers' compensation claims, railroad retirement, a slew of Department of Labor claims, and there's others as well in which a mass adjudication system is directly reviewed by a federal appellate court, but when there are systemic problems, there's no way to group those claims together to ensure that there is coherent and consistent review. Um, there are three types of problems that I generally identify. I try to break it down into three different types of problems. So there's, there's problems with mootness, that sometimes the government agency can just frustrate the ability of uh, a federal appellate court to even review the action um, because it's not a class action. In a class action, even if the individual lead class member's claim becomes moot, the remaining claims can still kind of go forward. But when the claims proceed on an individual basis and you're left with, them, then those claims can sometimes be frustrated immediately. And that can be aggravated by the problem that exists in many federal agencies, which is that in many cases, there might be acute delays before you ever see that next case, like in the Black Lung Fund, where it might take 429 days before that can happen. Um, there might also be a problem with the fact that you can't even access a lawyer at all to interpret an appellate precedent. Um, that occurred uh, in the Ninth Circuit, where there is direct precedent saying that people should have notice and opportunity for counsel. Uh, the ICE has not been, has been routinely deporting children and people without providing with that notice. Um, when, when someone does get a lawyer, they immediately abandon the, the practice, but there's nothing to deal with that systemic problem because the claims can't be brought together as a class. The same also applies when there's inadequate information or a concern that there might be piecemeal relief. And this is a concern actually in the veteran benefit system before they adopted class actions. There would be cases where someone would file a mandamus petition to try to get review really quickly. Uh, but what would that do? It just shifts the, tear, the chairs on the, on the Titanic. <laughs> it just shifts, it, it, ends up, it ends up just kind of making people jump to the head of the line, arguably aggravating delays for everyone else. So without a systemic way to kind of identify groups of people who might be bogged down in the system, there's, an, a, there's a, a, a mismatch between what the federal appellate court can do to address that type of problem. Now, class actions of the All Writs Act um, would, are, rooted in an, are rooted in an act that has existed for centuries that says that uh, federal courts have the power to issue all writs that are necessary, appropriate, in aid of their respective jurisdiction and agreeable to the uses and principles of law. And it's long been seen as a gap filling statute, um, a statute that entitles federal courts to try to um, reach cases that otherwise escape their jurisdiction. And thus, in some cases, courts can issue writs to protect their prospective jurisdiction over a case, especially in delay cases. 
there might be no way to perfect your appeal because the case is bogged down in delays. So the All Writs Act allows a federal court, whether it's a district or an appellate court, to reach down and say, send me that case because you are interfering with my jurisdiction to resolve that case consistently with the law. Um, since uh, the 1940s, the Supreme Court has made clear that this act is like another delegation of power. Uh, seven years after the Rules Enabling Act was passed, the Supreme Court also described the All Writs Act as an act that conferred rulemaking-like authority. It offered, according to the Supreme Court, a legislatively approved source of procedural instruments not confined to the precise forms of the writ. And in so doing, allowed federal appellate courts to stay actions without a rule to do so, to conduct discovery without rules to do so. And more recently, what federal appellate courts have done since the 1970s is allowed district courts to, to hear class actions in the absence of a rule. So federal habeas cases for a long time um, didn't, didn't, per, didn't have a rule to hear class actions. Um, and so in the Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, the First Circuit, the Third Circuit, courts said, well, maybe they should be able to use the All Writs Act to hear those types of claims. And, and a, the, I think the, the most famous case is a case called Ciro v. Prizer, where the Second Circuit found that aggregating claims was necessary because petitioners lack counsel. Um, they underscored the inefficiency of hearing numerous types of individual petitions that all raise the same issue, and that they would ultimately escape judicial review. And um, that, that case was, was, was all, I won't say it was reaffirmed, but the Supreme Court has reviewed habeas class actions, most notably in the Garrity case, where it said it was really important to hear a class action in that type of context because they noted it was inherently transitory, that the government could frustrate judicial review. Um, I want to note, though, that the Supreme Court's never addressed this question, and that as recently as just two years ago, Justice Thomas suggested that maybe we should revisit uh, the idea of habeas class action. Um, but courts to this day continue to hear habeas classes, uh, most recently in the travel ban litigation. The very first case in the, in the travel ban litigation was actually a habeas class action uh, filed in the Eastern District of New York. Um, building on that authority, we were able to convince a fe the Federal Circuit um, last uh, two year, three years ago, to begin hearing class actions itself under the All Writs Act in a case called Monk v. Shulkin, they held that the, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims should be able to hear class actions for the same reasons I've been discussing before, that if they couldn't hear them, the government could routinely avoid litigation that impacted large groups of veterans uh, by selectively mooting their claims. And they believed that the class action was essential to, to the federal appellate court's ability to do its job, that, that by allowing them to bring class actions, the federal court could act as an error corrector, a lawgiver. It could efficiently resolve these claims without delay. Um, and since that time, there have been a number of class actions filed in this federal appellate court, some of which have been very successful. The most notable one, um, I've given you a list of a lot of them, but the most notable one is a case called Godsey v. Wilkie, which involved claims brought on behalf of about 2,000 veterans who were all waiting for their certificate of appeal. They, they, they couldn't essentially make their appeal. So the court certified a class under the APA, under the AWA, um, and it ordered the, uh, it, it sent them back down to the Department of Veterans Affairs and it ordered them to identify all the people who have been waiting, you know, in beyond two years to process them um, and to allow class counsel to, to, to identify anyone who kind of fallen through the cracks. Within 60 days, over 90% of them received their certificate of appeal. And there was another 10% that were being contested, but because there was class counsel there, like they didn't have to go through years more of litigation, litigating their individual appeals. There was class counsel that could kind of move for contempt and then they put pressure on them to eventually resolve all the cases. And with, within, um, now that it's been about a year and a half later, all the cases have now been given their certificates appeal and move through the system. So that's a really great, that's a success story, but it kind of illustrates 
where these types of class actions might be needed. It's for those cases that might fall through the cracks in mass adjudication systems where people don't ordinarily have lawyers and need the class device to ensure that the cases don't get mooted out, to ensure that they can have lawyers, um, and that after they get the relief they saw, that they actually get that relief. Because that's on the back end, that's another problem, which is that the court might provide the relief and then people never get it. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide and then just kind of highlight what I, what I was saying at the beginning is potential upsides and downsides of this approach. So one thing you might be thinking is like, well, do you really need class actions for this to prevent mootness? Like, isn't there some other way like short of a class action that appellate courts can make sure these cases are, don't go moot and they can still hear them, but they just change mootness doctrine so they can still hear them. That's possible, but it doesn't necessarily deal with those claims where lawyers never even get to the federal appellate court at all because of some systemic problem. Can the appellate courts really do this with limited fact finding? And in some cases they have, they've, they've relied, like at least the veterans court has relied significantly on the agency by remaining to the agency to develop facts and produce a record. And, and that's been helpful and that's kind of consistent with the way federal appellate courts work with agencies. Um, whether or not they'll be able to use special masters to do so is a contested question, but at least the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims believes it can do so and it's appointing a federal a special master to do so. Um, we can talk more about that in the Q&A about the extent to which the federal rules of appellate procedure allow special masters to do this. Um, are ancient writs the best way to do this? So here's the question. Here's a question. Like, like we have a rulemaking process that exists in our federal courts. Why not just go through the rulemaking process to do this? Is this the best way, relying on writs that were created in like the 1780s? And that's a good question. And finally, appellate courts are supposed to decide like kind of issues in the aggregate in a different way. They, they don't hear class actions, they decide precedent, which in some ways works like an arrogant decision because like those like cases are supposed to be treated in like manner. So why are we giving them power to your class actions? And yet, what I think the Veterans Court's experience has demonstrated and by surveying other different types of agencies I've re reached the conclusion about is that the class action still permits these unrepresented parties to pool information resources and challenge systemic problems that they can't do in mass adjudication systems where people have lawyers. Um, and not only that, they help the courts. They hear the courts hear system-wide questions that often evade their review while affecting compliance with court orders that, that they can't assure when, um, when it's the agency that ultimately controls the process. And that while you might have concerns about rulemaking in the shadows, like rulemaking without any type of formal process to do it, there are ways in which, at least in this context, like allowing some, a little bit of gap filling under the All Writs Act has really helped the rulemaking process. So as this particular court has begun hearing class actions the past two years, it's also been going through the process of developing a rule to do so. And it's been really helpful for this rulemaking body to see how class actions have been operating in action as they develop a rule. So this type of experimentation actually can provide for more informed rulemaking and it isn't necessarily that unbounded because the All Writs Act still requires that you meet a really high bar before you can bring that claim. You have to show it's a clear and indisputable right. Um, then there's no other way to get into a federal court. And finally, even though this might be seen as a power grab by federal appellate courts, I'd argue that the opposite uh, might actually be the way to view this. That, that, that instead, this might actually be a a way of effectuating Congress's original goal, which is to ensure that federal appellate courts could say what the law is in an expert and um, uh, effective forum um, in a way that provide, provided more cohesion to the law. And that without this, what we have seen, at least over the past, are efforts by a federal administrative state that can totally evade what federal appellate courts say what the law is. All right, so last thing I'll say about all this before I hear your questions is that um, I said this in my opening note, which is like, I don't know what to do with this paper. This was originally a short paper. It was like 20 pages and it was supposed to be 
a paper that just talked about, it was for a legal access forum. Um, and then I thought, you know what, maybe this idea is worth like expanding a little bit. And then I began expanding like the theoretical dimensions. And then I thought, oh, it needs more procedure. And then it got too long, so then I cut out the procedure. So in addition to the questions you have, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to make it and whether it should be an article or an essay and how to improve it. So thanks. Thank you. So I'll take, um, I'll uh, manage the queue. I already have Scott Dodson with a first question. Please, Scott. Hey, Adam. Um, yeah, so we've corresponded already about this paper, so you already know I'm pretty intrigued by it. Um, so I thought I'd make two comments, one that's more skeptical and one that's a little supportive, and then I'll ask a question. So my right. skeptical comment is that I doubt that the AWA authorizes the creation of uniform and prospective procedures that are designed to apply beyond a particular case. I don't think Harris v. Nelson really supports that. And I think that would conflict with the Rules Enabling Act. So if you're only proposing the use of the AWA for ad hoc procedures for a particular case, then I'd worry about uneven procedural justice across panels of appellate courts trying to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my skeptical comment. That's a fair point. My supportive comment is to offer another upside, which is that allowing appellate courts to hear class actions in the first instance uh, allows them to establish clearer and more direct precedent for class action law, because usually appellate courts are reviewing district court rulings on class action law for abuse of discretion. So you'll actually get some direct precedent on class action law this way. Hmm. My question is why individual actions can't work just as well with fewer administrative problems. I mean, we've seen uh, mass individual arbitrations against Uber that seem to be working particularly well. Uh, with very low dollar value cases uh, that you know, normally wouldn't be able to be enabled without a class action, but somehow are being enabled, or, or perhaps an MDL uh, type of device for the appellate court. So maybe we just need clever plaintiff attorneys and coordinated individual actions. Uh, I'll start with your question, and I wanted to talk about to your comments too. Um, uh, I think it's a it's a good question. I think some of the problems are that in the federal um, agencies themselves, we lack lawyers, um, and sometimes that's by design. Um, so in the, the, in the veteran system for years, you know, dating back to the 1870s, we had a rule that said that lawyers couldn't be paid more than $10 for the entire claim, and that was upheld as consistent with due process in 1985. Um, and the processes themselves inside of the agencies might not lend themselves to individualized processes. And then finally, sometimes the challenge isn't, sometimes the challenge isn't like to an actual benefit claim. It's to a something kind of system wide. And so like in the B2 context, not the B3 context, where you want to deal with a system wide problem, you the like you can't rely on the process below to, to, to kind of win through it, to kind of to correct the process in, unless you have some support from above. Um, in the mass arbitration context, I mean, it's important to think about and remember that those cases were originally brought as class actions and there has been some success, but I don't know if there would continue to be success if there hadn't already been a lot of notoriety and information about them. And a lot of these problems in the administrative state just don't, they're just not raising, they're just not raising um, enough of a red flag for people to even see that there's a problem. And they're so confusing and people get so bored by them that we just don't see it. And because there's not enough money to be made, from those types of cases. You only make the money like in the veteran system if you make it all the way up to the Court of Appeals and you get attorney's fees there. Um, there. There just aren't the same incentives for a professional plaintiff's bar to invest in improving that kind of public form of adjudication. So I, I still think that there's a real need here given how the federal agents themselves can, in some cases there's no money, like you're deporting kids. Um, can, can defeat jurisdiction in a variety of ways. There's no money, there's not as much money involved 
And because of the kind of cryptic and uh, difficult nature of kind of getting into the administrative process, it's, it's a system that's lack lawyers. Now, do I think that we could benefit if we had more lawyers who were doing this? Yes. But I also think the class action can complement that as opposed to undermine it. Like, it's, I think it, it would benefit us if we had a class action system that lawyers could were represent people as a class and still have those individual lawyers or law school clinics, you know, more investing more in these kinds of structural reforms alongside them. Um, the, the, one of the comments I wanted to address was direct, the direct precedent problem. This is actually something I struggle with because on the one hand, I do think that would be a benefit. Like, oh, now appellate courts will get experience with class actions and maybe they can make more informed decisions, not just produce more precedent, but more informed precedent because they'll actually know what a class action is. And these judges have definitely learned on the Court of Appeals for Benefits Claim. They've, they've just gotten a crash course in class actions. Um, one of the things I worry about, though, is that the AWA class is such a unique vehicle, you know, and that I worry that it might, it, I, I actually worry the opposite, that, that it might inform and, and skew their view of ordinary class actions and make them even more inclined to reject class actions that would be produced under a rule, because the standard for an AWA class action is so much higher. Um, so that's what I worry a little bit about bleed from the AWA class action context with a federal appellate court to the, the lower courts. But I hear that. I actually do think that's a benefit too. And your, your first point, um, will this lead to uneven justice? I think that's a fair point. I, I think that's a fair point. The, the reason why I've gone back and forth about, you know, like, is this the best way? Is the, is the AWA the best way? And um, I think the reason why I'm still, I still think it's the best way for now is because we just don't know enough about them. You know, we haven't seen them in action. I do think that there's some benefit to, even though it might be uneven at first, seeing how they play out, seeing where they might be valuable or less valuable, and then producing a rule, you know, and then actually producing a rule that leads to more even justice. And that model has been followed before. We saw that with settlement class actions. We saw that with the Federal Court of Claims, which for 10 years didn't have a class action rule. They just kind of felt their way through it. And then they made a rule and the rule ended up being, I think, a lot better because they had some experience doing it in a unique context. Rule, you're up next. Um, so, so I don't claim any particular expertise in this, <laughs> so forgive me. No. Um, I, I think I just have two points to make. Um, uh, one is, this is my sort of uh, particularly ignorant question, although you just touched on an issue. One. A uh, question of those as a downside would be the idea that actually appellate courts are are perhaps singularly inexpert in dealing with class actions and that perhaps we would want to find a different um, forum for solving this sort of problem. And, and you have some different workarounds with, well, we could remand to the agency, although that's sort of foxes and hen houses there, and, and the other being special masters, and maybe that's fine, I don't know. Um, but it does seem that whether appellate courts have expertise and resources for this particular task is, seems like an issue to me. Um, the other thing isn't really a question, it's more of a comment. You were asking about sort of where you go with this paper and, and how you frame it. And, yeah. and I guess the, the thing that popped into my mind um, was when you're sort of talking about the separation of power issue and the argument you had to make about like, no, actually this is furthering Congress's intent, not stealing power from the executive. Um, I was just reminded of the debates um, and particularly considering uh, both Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh are participants in these debates about Chevron and State Farm, right? That, that these are folks who in fact are particularly uh, worried about the separation of power problem in the opposite way that you're articulating, right? And they're the ones who are most likely to be saying, no, 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 no. We, we want to avoid giving sort of more power to courts in this area. Um, and I guess that's not true. No, no I'm sorry. I'm I was going to say that. that. I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. Gorsuch would say that. But Yeah, no, 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 you're right. Um, I, I guess particularly the critique of State Farm. Um, <laughs> is more consistent with a disagreement with your thesis. Maybe mm -hmm. let me keep it that narrow. Um, but that's certainly a frame and, and frankly, uh, saving my own ignorance, right? Certainly that overall debate 
is a way that you could frame this paper if you were looking for a more sort of expansive place to put it. Yeah. That's what I meant, that last thing I said. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, going to your comments about expertise and resources, like I think, this is going to sound bold, I think they have the resources. So um, the types of claims that would ultimately qualify for an AWA class action are delay claims, um, claims that there might be a process that frustrates review, so there, and there can be all kinds of processes like that. Um, they're, they're, they are B2 class actions. They're classes, actions that might involve like a, often will just involve a clean legal issue. And then the class action provides a benefit by ensuring they don't become mooted or providing attorney representation or assuring that there's someone there after the decision. And I think um, for those types of claims, at least at the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, there haven't been very many of them. I mean, there's still a lot. There's been about maybe 15 over the past three years or 20. Um, and, and, they, and for the ones that they've certified, they haven't had too much of a problem. And the reason why I think it's a particularly important source to look at is because the Court of Appeals for Veteran Claims hears about 6,600 appeals from it, this administrative agency. That's the entirety of what federal appellate courts review for, all the federal appellate courts review for all of other administrative appeals. So um, this is just one nine member court that's able to do it. I think you know the rest of the federal appellate courts could probably handle this too. I don't think it would be too much of a strain. The expertise is an issue. And I, I think that's an issue. Like federal appellate judges don't know class actions, um, but I think they can learn. Um, I think they can learn, and I think that if we wanted to take seriously the idea that we want federal appellate judges to review government bodies because they provide more consistency for a body that's operating across different geographic lines, and I mean, if you buy that, which is what the Supreme Court has, and we have a long literature on it, but I don't know if I do, but if you buy that, then, then why not give them the tools to kind of do that job even if it requires some learning? Um, I think that's kind of where I fall out on that. On um, framing the paper, thank you. That's that's really helpful. I think, um, you know, one of the ways that State Farm may or may not be a problem is the way in which these appellate courts are hearing these cases, which is they often, when it, it involves an issue involving agency policy or expertise, they remand. And so they remand so the agency can develop more factual findings, and then they have like that that State Farm like review. Maybe that eases that. But the separation of powers framing, thank you. That, that's helpful. I'll, I'll think about that. Okay. Um. Dave, and I want to remind people, please use the raise hand function if uh, you want to uh, raise questions. Please go on. Okay, um, so my question is actually, I was gonna ask something sort of similar to Rule's question. And so what I've got is gonna be a little bit of a minor offshoot about it, of it. Um, I, I wonder if, if you could just say a little bit more about how special masters fit into this. You mentioned that as a possibility and, and for the same competence reasons that Rule was talking about that you were just talking about. Uh, it seemed to me that that would be important. So I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about where the specific authority to, to, to appoint special masters comes from and what its boundaries are and how extensive yeah. you would see their use being. Thanks. Yeah. Sure, sure. So there is a federal appellate rule that re allows for the appointment of special masters. I'm not sure how far, like, so, I have to say, like no other federal court has, has done this before, so I don't know how far they would interpret the rule. That rule allows um, to review issues that are ancillary to the case, and the question is um, whether or not the class action, a class action for all these other people, would qualify as ancillary. Um, I don't know that it does. Typically, what ancillary means when, when a federal appellate court wants to appoint a special master is for like attorney's fees or contempt or other things that might frustrate its jurisdiction. Um, but that might be one source of authority, the federal rules of appellate procedure. Um, a second source of authority might actually be the, either the All Writs Act or another body of law that allows the federal appellate court to develop um, information as justice requires. Um, some there is some old circuit law that actually has allowed federal appellate courts to do that when reviewing class actions, when reviewing like the appropriateness of class counsel. So I could see a federal appellate court doing that. Um, there, there, some courts have suggested, you know, uh, when there's a channeling statute that um, 
that you could, they could also, the federal appellate court could also do, kind of develop this information, deal with the fact that everything's channeled to it through judicial notice. And I just think that's a non-starter. I don't think judicial notice would work um, because judicial notice has to be non-contested and they're gonna contest the, like one of those common questions that give rise to a class action. Um, I think of, of those different options, the federal rules of appellate procedure, um, allowing for some factual development and supplemental supplemental factual development as justice requires, or the All Writs Act. Um, what I'm seeing and hearing, at least from the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, is that they're, it looks like they're going to do use the All Writs Act um, to do so. And and that's not that's not crazy because most of the use of the All Writs Act that's been endorsed by the Supreme Court. Um, has been for factual development. It's been for the development of uh, allowing for interrogatories and other forms of things that can supplement the record. Um, and uh, I think their view is that if the case really warrants mandamus, then they can appoint a special master or do it using that kind of additional authority. Now, the special master, just by way of background, special masters are used very frequently by federal district courts um, in hearing class actions. And oftentimes they do like the line, they can do the lion's share of the work, um, and it just a, a federal district court judge has to approve it. Um, but, but, and so I think that's what they're envisioning here. Um, and this particular court has actually uh, asked Congress to set aside funds so they can hire a full time special master to do that. Um, so I think that's kind of where I thought that's, but those are the boundaries, like those are kinds of the questions. Um, one, I guess, final point about all of that is. My view about class actions is that they're most important in structural reform cases um, in the cases where there actually are really intense factual questions. You know, there's some unstated policy or practice the agency's engaging in. They're separating families from children. You know, like, they, like the federal government didn't admit to that for months. The ACLU brought a class action, but they didn't actually have direct proof of that until there was some discovery. Uh, and, and it's the class-wide vehicle that helps you develop and see that there's, you know, some forest from the trees. And, and, and that's where I'm most disappointed in this kind of vehicle, because, because there's no way that I think a federal appellate court would be able to appoint a special master to do something like that, to develop like kind of the intense factual record that you would need to kind of see some unconstitutional policy and practice on the ground. Um, but what I do see it being used is for cases like Godsey, where you're trying to kind of see what's happening with all these veterans and just to identify them. Um, that's something that this court has felt comfortable with and I think could comfortably fit under the rules, as well as another case called SCAR, where there's a number of veterans who were exposed to radiation in Spain and they just, they just wanted to identify them and understand what the, the scientific question was that, that led the Department of Veterans Affairs to deny all their claims um, so that they could review them again. So for those more limited factual questions, I think it could fit under one of those different prongs. Rick Marcus? Well, maybe like Scott, uh, I've been trading messages with Adam, and so I'm going to add a couple of reactions to comments today. First off, I think that I seriously question Scott's suggestion that appellate decisions under the All Writs Act in this manner are going to give any guidance to the district courts unless we are going to say the district courts <clears throat> are not bound by Rule 23. Uh, and the problem we have here is there is a federal rule of appellate procedure regarding uh, administrative review that has an intervention feature. Um, Adam is talking about gap filling. One of the questions is, where's the gap? Um, and so my main back and forth with him is about the All Writs Act as a kind of independent to the Rules Enabling Act source of authority for doing things. And I'm really curious whether he isn't saying you have to have what in classic class action analysis would be called one-way intervention. You're going to find under the All Writs Act that uh, a class action is authorized because you've already decided the plaintiffs are going to win. Or is this class action binding on the entire class even if the plaintiffs lose? So I'd be rather cautious about creativity too much. 
both of us, Adam and I, were at an event the Court of Veterans Appeals put on three years ago or so concerning what I thought was rulemaking, but maybe it was free form uh, substitute activity. So I, one other thing that occurs to me, actually, Adam, you mentioned that, uh, that, that the rulemaking solved the problem of the settlement class action. What happened in 1997 was that the 1996 proposal for a Rule 23B4 was withdrawn after the AMCHEM decision. And when we came back to that um, four years ago and thought about it again, no rulemaking occurred. So that still exists in the nether world. And maybe we should be uneasy about that as well. But I continue to be uneasy about your AWA approach. And I wonder what you do about the mining effect on class members if the class loses and how this might provide guidance for rulemaking later and who would make those rules. Um, I'm trying to think which, where should I start? Um, so let me start with the last one first. Um, how would it provide guidance? I think one of the biggest issues with a class action in a federal appellate court is for the appellate court to try to figure out when they're worthwhile. Because remember, a federal appellate court, once they kind of decide what the law is, like that's supposed to have an aggregate binding impact, you know? And so when is it worthwhile? And one of the things that's come up in four different cases that have been litigated in the veterans court is they're worthwhile at least when, there's a, when there is a concern either with mootness or with government recalcitrance. Um, when there's a concern that the decision either won't reach the federal appellate court, or for some reason the, the decision can't be functionally carried out, there might be a need independent of their power to kind of set the precedent, precedent for a region to also have some mechanism to aggregate those claims. So not reaching the court. Like there, there are, if the case is never gonna get to the court because of systemic delays, that might be a quintessential case in which you need that class action in order to get those cases up there so they can be decided. Um, and that seems like actually like a, a classic reason for the All Writs Act. Like the All Writs Act is all about trying to protect the jurisdiction, the potential prospective jurisdiction of that court when it might be undermined by some other body below it. Um, and, uh, and if it's the case that the court gets that, you know, if it's the case that the court gets that, and then the under, you know, the underlying decision is there's no unreasonable delay here, you know, class cert denied, then I don't know if that ultimately has a binding effect on the other substantive issues in those cases, but certainly it would be binding that okay, they don't have a delay, you know, because as a group, their claims have been waiting, you know, in administrative purgatory for two and a half or three. Same thing kind of goes for the after effect, like a, like a decision, like there was another case called Wolf, where they decided that veterans got a benefits when they went to the emergency room. And not only the Veterans Administration not follow it, but they affirmatively discourage veterans from applying for it, um, thereby preventing those cases from even reaching the federal appellate court again. So once they finally did get the case brought as a class, they were able to kind of certify it and then, and then make sure that all of them got their benefits that they should have been getting for the past couple of years. So it provided a vehicle to kind of group those together. Had that court said, no, you know what? They're not violating the rule. There's no reason for it here. Then again, I think one way, I mean, I think it should be binding. You know, I, I think that should be binding. And, and, and then there might still be other types of claims they can make, but, but I think that's, that's always the case for, you know, rule 23 B2 cases that, you know, you either you win or you lose. Um, on the question of gap filling and whether or not it complements or undermines rulemaking, I didn't know that about, I, I thought there was a rule for settlement class actions and I thought, um, so there's nothing, there's just no, but we do have like at least, like we have some guidance from the rulemaking body or you're shaking your head still no, <laughs> like we don't even have that. Um, but I, I always- unless, have, unless you consider, uh, a rule that was published for public comment and withdrawn, and then some chit chat 
20 years later, uh, there's nothing in writing I know of. So, you know, what that speaks to maybe is another potential downside of experimental rulemaking is that it might take the wind out of the sails of, or, or take power away in some ways from the rulemakers to be able to do it because the courts have started moving ahead and then it's really hard to kind of be able to kind of like form a rule now that the courts have started acting. Some have said that the courts are moving backward. I'm a little worried about getting in between the two of you. Yeah. Um, I just want to give all of our participants oh, sorry, the sorry. end of our official time. No, sorry. I want to first invite everyone who can stay to, to hang out and continue to talk to Adam about this incredibly yeah. interesting paper. For those of you who need to drop off at this time, just let, let's all please thank Adam. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I'm certainly going to stick around. Feel free to do so, but I know that many of you need to drop off. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here and doing this um, over Zoom. and. I really look forward to being able to see you guys in person and do this.